Good evening, everybody. And it is wonderful to see so many people here. So many of you have, uh, have arrived. Um, we haven't quite run out of room, but very nearly. So we're going to start by talking about uh, what Sujata has been doing. Sujata won her first poetry competition at the age of eight with a poem about her father, who was a superhero and village doctor who used to visit, visit his, pa pa his patients flying through the air in his 1970s flares. But to his disappointment, she didn't follow in his footsteps. She ran off to art school and joined a rock and roll band instead. She holds a first class honours degree and an MA in the visual arts. Sujata is also a talented musician. She has been songwriting, recording and performing with the band Satsangi for tw 20 years. Their music has been featured in Rolling Stone magazine and their videos have been shown on MTV and the BBC big screens throughout the UK. By day, she is a holistic health practitioner and integrates poetry into her yoga classes and retreats. Last year, she entered our annual competition and we published one of her poems in the competition and anthology, What the Peacock Replied. We were impressed by the vigor, energy and musicality of her poems. She has launched fully into the poetry world this year with this, her first collection. The, uh, and she's just completed a poetry commission awarded by the Coventry School uh, City of Culture. So without more from me, let's hear from Sujata and I will mute myself. Janet, uh, just firstly, a huge thank you to you and Donal for um, believing in my work and helping me to bring it into the world and for keeping independent publishing alive as well, alive and kicking. And um, also heartfelt thanks to everyone who's taken the time to come and join us tonight. I really appreciate it very much. So um, I'm going to start off um, with a group of six poems um, which describe a range of experiences during time spent at my ancestral home in um, Kerala, India. Uh, you'll find Kerala on the southernmost tip of India, about a 45 minute plane ride from the Maldives. This first poem is also the opening poem of the book and tries to convey a sense of my late maternal grandmother's house, a place so magical to me when growing up that I wanted to preserve it somehow in writing. Sadly, this small estate with its luscious compound of roses and coconut trees is now in the process of being sold as there's no one left to look after it now. But in a twist of serendipity, the buyers are going to transform the property into a yoga and Ayurveda retreat, so I might even get a job. And I'm really delighted about that. So uh, first poem is called Exotica. They await me at the end of a long swollen road hemmed in by the Western Ghats, reborn on royal Enfields, strewn with garlands of jasmine and red tinsel, hoping to serenade me along the last few miles to grandmother's house on the edge of a lazy snake charmed village. It is a place that hangs in the clouds, yet is equally of the earth, ferrous red and cracked into lines of ants. At the end of the old stone kitchen is a well with a thousand silver fish and a stove over which many stories have been boiled into their milky essence, poured into cups of cardamom chai and given freely to visitors who have come to see the English, not English girl with the fringe. Between the front of the house and the back, a phantom limbed veranda. You can sit here and drink the monsoon as it drips down from the thatch, poised like a hummingbird between heaven and hell, that love-hate kiss you give to the homeland. I circled around these shiny morsels today, perched on a bench in the middle of England. So poem number two 
if there's one thing that transports me back to India in a heartbeat, it's the ja smell of jasmine oil. It's like India in a bottle. But because jasmine is such an expensive oil, I sometimes use Lang Lang, which is similar, cheaper, and has a slightly more sweeter and heady smell. So this next poem is called Jasmine. Yin and yang, yang and yin, Lang Lang smells like jasmine. Jasmine is condensed milk of the moon that sleeps all day in the sea, turning and churning white morning waters in lacto-galactic bloom. Yang and yin, yin and yang, Lang Lang smells like jasmine that flakes from a star or a cold lunar scar hung high by hot hands in stale garlands of light above bananas and gourds and okra and cloves like a pearl-powered jubilee. Yin and lang, lang and yin are the top notes, heart notes, bass notes of a song I dreamt into a flower. Poem three. For me, India is a land full of paradoxes and polarity with extreme wealth and extreme poverty, dirty and pure, quiet and meditative and also wired and totally insane. This poem is about the craziness of Indian cities that many people visiting for the first time describe as a culture shock. The Magic Roundabout. Every trip out into the melt is like Russian roulette played with a marla bead. The spinning wheel of the magic roundabout is a whirl of baby elephants, rickshaws, bikes, scooters, cars, crows, vegetable sellers, stray dogs, and bright hallucinogenic lorries, all within an inch of death from each other. There is a man cradled on the ledge of a fresh 20-story high-rise, having a nap on a ledge as thin as his leg. If he's still there in 30 minutes, he will continue to work on the spray of wires, which might offer a less messy end. On the windowsill overlooking the sleeping suicide, two pigeons, happy and inseparable, and always there when we return to this house from home. Being as free as birds, they are not knife to the edge by penury, but are perfectly balanced in life as on the ledge. I've never had to visit that brink either. My circus was the tightrope tied between two retreating worlds with a safety net of pride and privilege. But I was becoming heavy. India has given the world so many amazing things, but health and safety ain't one of them. So poem four. An Indian wedding in the UK is one thing, but an Indian wedding in India is quite another. It really is a carnival of the senses and a time of indescrib indescribable beauty and excitement and gossip. Sari Safari. It's wedding season and arranged love is in the air. The earrings of the neighbor who wasn't invited hang like the chandeliers on Harley Street, dripping with excess rent. The ladies who have been invited form a silk rainbow around the bride about to buckle bend from her weight in gold. She has not far to walk to the heavenly stage, which I imagine would actually feel like heaven if it weren't hooked up to 20 televisions and 10,000 eyes outside, not hyperbole. The ceremony is short and hypnotic, filled with such fire and grace. I thought I had been standing there for a lifetime, or at least India time, which is the time zone my husband says I operate in. I had been delayed for my own wedding too, but have never been as unpunctual to anything as my own life, crawling through my 40s like I did in my first egg and spoon race and disqualified for making a false start. I like to call it IMT time or in my own time, because at least that sounds like I have some control over the matter, which of course I don't, because once the call of the bride arrives, so does the wild dance of the sari safari, sandals, bangles and scandals and clocks turn to the wall. 
So the next poem um, is called Black Grapes. I spent just over a year studying, or more like not studying, in a convent in India uh, about around the age of 11. The girl in this next poem was everything I wasn't at school, but despite being annoyingly perfect, she was such a sweet soul and has left a lasting impression on me. I think we would have been the best of friends had she let her hair down a little behind the backs of the evil nuns. Black grapes. Deepti's braids dripped full fat ink, coiled thick and hung like grapes. At night, her fruit fall bounced in the mirror, leaped from pale breasts and down the wave of her spine, knotted and gnarled from sitting too straight in a wild, wonky world. In her mind, ten fingers glide to ride the swell of each curl pulled at the waist. There is another life that runs loose through long hair, but how to catch it when you can't even pick up the brush. And the final poem in this uh, first section, this first group of poems, um, sees me back at my grandmother's house, but more specifically in her mystical prayer room. It's a place that will always loom large in my imagination having been a dark, sensuous, and also slightly scary place to my young eyes. I'd probably describe it now as Indian noir or Indian Gothic. It's called Camera Obscura. Prayers are kept in the dark room, lit by the triple flame of Arthi, reflecting on flames of ancestors and avatars. 10 arms flicker in the corner of sight, animated past death by fire, and a sword is shining on the altar, a funeral pyre where evil is slain and spiraled up to salvation in sandalwood smoked and sweet. I once thought I saw a sacrificial fish, scales about to give up its secrets from the sea, but I had caught a chink of wrapping, flashing its two-toned skin, and now assigned forever to paper the cracks of a plastic cockroach sanctuary. The breath of impending monsoon warns the lamp, which signals all a flicker to black souls trapped behind glass, framed and fuming, to get ready for the shot. We kneel, we pray, we point our tongues. We kneel, we pray, we click our teeth. We kneel, we pray, we capture no God, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you. Thanks, Janice. That's the first set of poems. Thank you very much, Sujata. That was a lovely selection. Really sets the scene. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from one of Sujata's guests, Sally Tissington. Sally has, has published a novel and, and has won awards for short stories, flash fiction and film. She's just com completed an MSc in creative writing for therapeutic purposes, where her research was about creative wildness, something of great importance to her. She has previ previously taught creative writing at universities and in the community, including working for Headway, the brain injury char charity. Her poetry has been shortlisted by Nine Arches Press for the Primers Volume 6 series. And so we're all going to unmute and listen, I mean mute and listen to Sally. Sally, Sally Tissington. Hi, firstly to say Sue, thanks so much for inviting me and, and hearing you read those six poems was just beautiful. So. Thank you. I've got three short pieces to share with people tonight. And the first one is sort of inspired by a domestic argument. One of my earrings ended up in the washing, up, washing machine and broke it. Um, so this poem is sort of a justification and an excuse, an unlikely tale in a way as to what happened and how the earring ended up in the washing machine. It's called Washing Machine Fish. 
You pull an earring from the washing machine filter and wave it in my face. A pretty bead on the end of a hook. Put that back in the drum immediately or we will have nothing to eat. How can I catch a washing machine fish, rare and elusive, able to tumble repeatedly in rough water with no hook? The clothes are dry, the pockets went unchecked. You pick the bits of tissue from your jeans with angry pincer movements. Leave the confetti alone, I ask. It only happens when clothes secretly marry, when something with pockets falls for something with sleeves. My second one um, is about last year, I sustained a back injury, which kept me out of action for about five months. So this poem is about the difficulty of sort of approaching the medical establishment when you're in, in a lot of trouble and feeling very vulnerable. And it's called Dragon. The doctor lies on top of a mountain of painkillers, a dragon on top of treasure. Just like a dragon, he has no use for them. After days of phone calls and treacherous mountain passes, you've made it to the surgery lair, a diminished version of yourself, spluttering, incoherent. Your neck strains as you stare up at him on top of chalices, diamonds, stethoscopes and pocket watches. You need to convince him that you're not the sort of person who might misuse treasure, spending it lavishly. You must pretend that you can hoard too. Highly addictive, he growls. You said it so many times in the past, although there is no personal knowledge of this. Finally, he shifts imperceptibly and a tiny few jewels, enough for a week, slip down to your feet. And my final one um, is about um, how we hang on to things, how I hang on to things that we could let go of and how getting on with your own creative work might be the best idea instead of wasting time. And it's called Belief Blanket. I tried to hold off winter, refused to change the clocks and slept cuddling a polythene bag full of tulip bulbs, a teddy bear with no defined limbs, whose stuffing offered no softness, but sharp, potentially sprouting points. The earth called to me at night, hand those bulbs over. You don't have the gifts to bring them to life. I held on tighter. The little bulbs squealed. I'd made them fearful of burial and darkness. Enough messing about, said the earth. The date on the packet cannot be ignored. I handed them over sulkily, almost threw them into the soil. With them gone, I stopped obsessing about other people's work and began my own, to which I was better suited. Months later, I'd slung the ragged belief blanket, the writer's equivalent of soil, over my sentences even though it was only held together with mug stains and fury. Thank you. Thanks, Sue, for letting me have this opportunity to read. And thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Sally. I could relate to all three of those poems. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to hear from Sujata again. Sujata, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. You're such an inspiration to me and it's a real honour to, to read alongside you. Um, this next group of poems are mainly about experiences growing up in Lancashire in the 70s and then Warwickshire during the 80s. And it struck me while I was doing an interview for Mackerel magazine recently that although I was born in Wales and brought up in the UK and identify as being British, um, I still feel that the motherland is India because the ancestral bond is so powerful. This first poem was one of uh, 50 out of just over, I think, 1500 entries to be chosen by the poet Callum James to be included in the Brian Dempsey Memorial Competition Anthology. Um, it did lead to the publication of this book and what is beginning to feel like a life uh, changing journey. The gaze. It was an Indian summer in Wigan, a fragrant afternoon. Mother's orange frangipani sari trailed like a peacock's tail in the apple blossom, showered down in reverence to cushion her steps. I had been collected from school, bottle green and chubby, 
splashing through the petals as we walked home. 20 years later, I developed a plume soaked in violet and gold and mosaiced in confetti cast from soft hands. 20 years later, I sit and stroke each feather, the orange ones now almost red. All eyes in the past, all eyes looking back, all eyes fanned wide, gazing at the girl who blazed into a woman. So poem two, the next piece was inspired by a poem called The Patience of Ordinary Things by the American poet Pat Schneider. And thank you, Sharon Brooks, for introducing me to her. The um, ordinary thing that I decided to write about and reimagine was a sewing needle. This is called Silverfish. The needle darts in and out of the herringbone like a silverfish in the carpet flashing Morse code to save the button. Its fine tip sting once picked out a long boat of a splinter and left its poison to bathe in the excavation. Such a needle was also used to pierce my sister's little ears and my mother's nose the old fashioned Indian way. But me and my blood sister boiled it three times before we pressed our 16 year old thumbs together and scratched our name across the other's wrist. Also at that time, a habit of sewing my school skirt so tight, I had to walk sideways up the stairs. And this brings me to the clothes my mother stitched onto my dollies, which I had to cut off before I put them to bed. This is what happens when you squint through the eye of a needle. So um, poem three is quite short. Like the first poem, Exotica, which questions who and what is considered exotic, depending on cultural context, this poem invites you to consider Englishness or Britishness as exotic through the eyes of my family. It's called Chips Three Ways. And um, Amma in, in, um, in, in Indian Kerala means mother. So Chips Three Ways. Amma whispers puka prayers that set sail through generations. I think this is why dad orders omelette and chips when we go to Shimla Palace. And my mum went for a McDonald's veggie burger and fries for her birthday instead of being taken to King Baba or the Indian Queen. The reason you can't see my forehead or my long curly name. Oh, and I prefer instant coffee, black, no sugar, no masala and no chai. Poem four. Generally speaking, in Indian communities, everyone has the potential to be an auntie or an uncle. Hence, this poem is called Strangers. A new auntie was due to visit in the afternoon. New because aunties are mass produced in little India. Just like you are likely to be gallstoned for being female, fat and 40, you qualify to be an auntie if you add Indian onto that list. If you bring Boli or Ladu, you may even be promoted to Amma or Mother. The one that arrived at 12 p.m. early enough to snatch away my dinner looked like she had perfected the trick into a profession, a dinner monger with tremendous teeth that protruded like tuning forks or parrot's claws used to manipulate food. My sister was three years old when auntie picked her up little fingers trying to press down each key or toe, depending on which way you looked at it. Not knowing how to blush, everyone moved swiftly to the dining room, hoping the little girl would be released for proper food. When it was time to leave, everyone blocked the front door, exchanging last minute gossip that turned into major news. Our kid was sent like a wound up toy to kiss auntie goodbye and to disperse the crowd. So poem five, my earliest and fondest memories of life here in England are of growing up in the seventies when it was common for doctors, surgeries like my dad's to also double up as a home. For the first 10 years of my life, we lived in Wigan and this poem is about our home here at number 12 Eccleston Street. 
number 12 Eccleston Street. The ambulance was ready, flashing bright orange flowers and nylon, a bumpy ride from hospitality above to clinic below. In the days you could visit doctors almost in pajamas. There were options, shoot through the big door and cause patients, or take a first right into the waiting room where we would eat dinner in about six hours time. But I usually took a second right into the room with glowing purple antiseptic, a color so magical it would tow me into another world. When I returned from my rounds, I'd visit Auntie Eva who'd serve brown files through the hatch from the kitchen and me a packet of polos, which is probably why I now have a hole in the middle of each tooth. Next stop, past the storehouse of samosas, spices and milk sweets, the outside toilet, where patients pissed out smoke. I could see it leaking through the keyhole. No wonder they needed to see my dad, sitting behind his desk with a sign which said no smoking and a drawer full of fags. A mum set off the fire alarm again with masala fish fry. The ambulance was ready. So this uh, final poem we're, um, is called Upstairs Downstairs um, with reference to the 70s programme of that name. Many of you know that I am also a singer and songwriter and I've been asked over the years about my early influences and how I developed my love of integrating Eastern melodies with indie rock. Here is my explanation in um, poem form. Upstairs Downstairs. Mother left dinner at the top of the stairs on a cracked wham tray, splitting George and Andrew right down the middle. Voluntarily imprisoned in my room, I feasted on a, uh, no, sorry, I feasted on a hunk of houses of the holy and stairway to heaven with fingers raw from stale air guitar. Downstairs, Amma was singing in ribbons of rag that tied themselves around the lotus feet of Sri Robert Plant. Occasionally, you could hear a lyric that transformed into English as it escaped through the walls to remind me in no uncertain terms that I belonged downstairs as well as upstairs. In later years, I wrote songs such as Rockin' Rani, Bolly Parton and Grease. What a difference a stair makes. Thank you, Janice. That's my stuff. Oh, I love that last one. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to another guest reading, and it's Sue Johns. Um, Sue originates from Cornwall, where she started performing as a punk poet in the 1980s. She has pu pu uh, published three pamphlets and two full collections, the most recent being Hush, Morgan's Eye Press 2011, Rented, Poems on Prostitution and Dependency, published by Palewell Press in 2018, and a new pamphlet, Track Record, which we, Dempsey and Windle, published last year. Oh, sorry, this year, I think. She was highly commended in the Prol competition and the Amnes Amnesty International competition. Her work has appeared in a wide range of anthologies and magazines, including Poetry News, The Morning Star, South Bank Poetry, Dreich, The Atlanta Review, Prol, Brittle Star, The Alchemy Spoon, The Big Issue and London Grip. And she's just completed an MA in writing poetry. So Sue, let's hear from you now. Thank you, Janice. And thank you so much, Sue. I'm just having such a fab time listening to you read your poems. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to read three fairly newish pieces, unpublished pieces. Um, and the first two are part of a, a sequence of five, uh, which is called Dolls. Dolls One. Sitting on the cemetery wall is a doll otherworldly, too tiny to be real, tightly clothed in child-sized black, jacket zipped right up against the world, needing someone to answer her phone. My neighbour will tell me 
she was beautiful once. She still is, just ravaged. Her mousy grey hair has a bright blue edge, not a fashion choice. Long since coloured, long since washed. Without it, she'd blend into the dust. Here comes the woman from the local chemist, stopping, smiling, her body language motherly with a hint of warning. The doll says thank you. From my upstairs window, I can't hear her, but I want to name her sister. I want to bring her in, as I brought my brother in, to a foaming bath, closed in the machine, place soft towels on the scars and shivering. Like those dolls girls are given to teach us to nurture, I'd feed her, then feed her again. My neighbour will tell me she had a boyfriend who beat her, how easily she would break, and her dealer is late, extremely late. A just ask van pulls up, drives on, where is the doll who I cannot call a woman, who must have a childhood before she is grown? She is swinging on a Red Bull, with her calls all going to voicemail. I do not offer anything, and now she's gone. Two. The porch is an abattoir in miniature. Where is the sash from the kimono? A Maori, her grass skirt in shreds, has lost her head. The flamenco dancer, minus hands and castanets, maintains a painted smile. A Welsh high hat has been hurled down the hall by the cat who is having his jaws inspected for clogs. Snug, smug, an Eskimo survives. The tiles are a litter of DDT and limbs, left out for the ants who have legged it or are dead. He's just a baby. He doesn't understand. This is my little brother's design. We'll buy them again, Dad says. Mum says nothing. She understands how men and babies can smash the world of girls. And from um, childhood memories to adolescent memories. Um, this is a, a specular poem. I, the uh, second half is a mirror of the first and it's called Cupboard Love. She is clever, though we don't know what to do with her. Arms folded stubbornly under the chest, just so demanding. There must be a remedy for nylon housecoats, immobilised by the weight of perms. To the sound of vegetables boiling, boiling, a group of women discuss me as if I wasn't there. As if I had no opinion, I'm engraving a pan of solidified lard. As I cancel my final date with optimism, I will carve the word no. There is a drawer full of knives. I am sharper than their answer. It is always yes, because I said so. Their answer, it is always yes, because I said so. There is a drawer full of knives I am sharper than. I will carve the word no as I cancel my final date with optimism. I'm engraving a pan of solidified lard as if I wasn't there. As if I had no opinion, a group of women discuss me to the sound of vegetables boiling. Boiling housecoats, immobilised by the weight of perms, just so, demanding there must be a remedy for nylon. Arms folded stubbornly under the chest. We don't know what to do with her. She is clever though. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sue, that was lovely. I'm fantastic to hear new poems, I'm very strong. Thank you. And we're going to go back to Sujata. Sujata is going to read now, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I could listen to you all day. 
Um, you're such an incredible performer and I'm really looking forward to seeing you live very soon. Um, so this next set of poems are 10 in number, but are quite uh, nine in number, but are quite short and flip between India and the UK and across my 50 years. My parents' mother tongue is um, Malayalam, a language from South India. Now and again, and quite naturally, to the amusement of my sister and I, uh, they mispronounce words. So for example, you don't adopt a child, you adapt a child. I mean, it could work, right? Children have to adapt. Um, but sometimes it can get a little bit out of hand, such as when the electrician came around to help my dad, um, who described there being a wanky, not a wonky, but a wanky screw in the plug socket. But mispronunciations and misspellings can also be quite enlightening, as I write about in this next poem. It's called Creme Brulee. My mother's first language is not English, which is why she thinks my father has a soft corner for their cat. I don't have any undiagnosed lumps or bumps, so I'm already tender inside, but with edges torched into a brittle battle, that crack with every tap, tap, tap of fingers poking into nooks collapsing from the ooze. If I had grown inside a chewy skin, my corners may have softened instead of crumbling, just like mother said, whose first language is not English. Poem two is a response to the uh, recent destruction of city monuments and the reconstruction of histories and identities. It's called My Regeneration. I've lived a live wire, ricocheted, swayed to a snake, juicing whole clothes, whole cities squeezed to their unholy waters. But the streetlights remain, glow spot the stains of monuments swallowed to a pulp, paper mache to an egg that will never crack or boil hard any truth. Show me your sunny side and I will show you my shell. Poem three was inspired by the British Indian poet Nikita Gill, who has taken a group of classical fairy tales and reworked them through a feminist lens. This is called The Mermaid's Torso. This is for Apu and Apana. There's too much sparkle on your scales. It's going to outshine your human side, which is already drowning. This was coming from a seahorse that didn't know what time of day it was, or that it wasn't half a horse. The mermaid transferred the pearlescent flecks onto her burnt brown skin that flashed a sea of lighthouses to keep predators at bay, the ones that wanted to cannibalize her off the bone. But once the twinkle was scraped off her tail, it began to corrode and eat itself like fish eating gangrene. She didn't care, not a bit. She was only half human after all. Poem four was inspired by Pukka Tees. So thank you, Sebastian Pohl. This is called uh, Turmeric Gold. If I were a mark left in your memory, I'd be a yellow ring left by a mug of turmeric tea you spat out and spluttered to its bitter end. It made you reach down for the skittle I didn't know was stuck in my pocket because you know every soft corner of me, every stained edge and every skilled shape I make in gold. If I were a mark left in your memory, I'd be a yellow ring left by a mug of turmeric tea, a blurred but stubborn boundary. So um, this next poem is very short and it sees me back at my grandmother's kitchen table in India and the funny conversations we would have with my very strict great uncle. And it's the uncle, Anjali, if you're here, um, that stuck a great big needle to pierce your ears. And um, it's called Fine Dining. It was lunchtime at grandmother's house. The bottle of ketchup we had bought with us from England was proudly displayed in the middle of the table. We dipped our bread in it like it was truffle oil and talked about breasts in the middle of the sun. 
that we didn't bring. And how funny it was that English girls were now wearing bindis and brown boyfriends. So poem six. The first thing that John and I like to do when we touch down in Kerala is to head off to the coastal town of Kovalam, where you will find the garden of Seaface Hotel overlooking the beach and the Arabian Sea. It's our way of taking a bit of time to adjust to what is always a culture shock and an assault on the senses. This poem is called Sea Breeze, named after the cocktail. Ingredients, 50 ml of vodka, 100 ml of cranberry juice, 50 ml of freshly squeezed grapefruit, ice, thin slice of lime. Instructions, one, take a seat outside. They will put you by the swimming pool beneath the fingered palms where a sitarist will later play tonight. But ask for the table by the sea where you can hear old songs from its shells. Two, order fried cutlets. They will bring mango salsa or sauce but ask for the green chutney that burns a rock pool to your tongue, a taste of the coast rolling all the way home. Take a sip. Go ahead, take a sip. They will bring thin slices of lime. Swap them for light cheese, boys bobbing fleshy in a syrup of calm. They will cut through the bitter and the sour that swells like oceans inside you. Four. For the next round, order a mocktail. Just take out the vodka and pretend you are a bird sweetly calling out your own bullshit. Five, shake it up, don't be afraid, don't forget the ice. Side note, for a cosmopolitan, swap the grapefruit for Cointreau and fuck off to Delhi. So uh, poem seven, just a couple more to go. Unlike uh, when writing songs, when I write poetry, I enjoy and love the freedom of working in free verse and irregular verse, where you are not constrained or limited by rhyme. However, I like breaking rules, including my own, and uh, this is the only rhyming poem in the book. Um, it's quite an old poem, and it started life as a song but ended up as a poem. It's called Rani's Jubilee, and Rani in the Indian language of Sanskrit means queen. Rani's Jubilee. Queen of hearts, mother of pearls, leader of women, teacher of girls. Queen of hearts, angel of doom, daughter of heaven, face of the moon. Queen of hearts, painter of stars, sculptress of rocks, Venus and Mars. Queen of hearts, empress of seas, priestess of love, the breath in the breeze. Queen of hearts, why could I not see? I am Rani and Rani is me. So the penultimate poem in this section, um, a poem about the power of shared experience to create lifelong bonds. It's called Cousins. It has a colossal trunk, dry wrinkled and crusty baked. So old, the cracks are aged with the royal pelt of moss and lichen. My elephantine tree swings wild in the wind and I am blown into the motherland on the back of a blue-billed bird that rides on the tusk of this wise mammal's head. My skin still feels England, a wetsuit shy and clinging, but it won't save me from the heat under the cotton trees or the coconut that might split my skull. It is a thin layer of rubber that separates you from me, me trapped on the inside, you repels on the outside, a dark impermeable membrane that stretches for miles, but could easily rip raw when we smell the jasmine in the Malabar breeze, see the baby elephant queuing in the traffic, Hear the ring of the temple bell by the sea. Feel the first drop of monsoon after the relentless fire. And devour the mangoes we both call home. And this final poem in, uh, in this section uh, is in the back of the book. It's the very last poem in the book and the last uh, yeah, poem in this section. Uh, it's called Appendix. Sleep will be the one to shatter this sack, not on my back. 
a dream of Gary glittering, is really Semtex spraying its son, swan song in graffiti, yellow and green, clogging the, the cogs of my ticking machine. I was only six when the surgeon told me I nearly died and prescribed something for night terrors, day tremors, aches that would turn to years. Then he took out the terrorist in my tummy, forgetting to leave its conviction already rooted to the bone. Hence, 40 odd years not believing I could do anything right. Thank you, Janice. Well, Sujata, you've done something right now, haven't you? <laughs> Lovely readings, thank you. Um, and we're going to hear from your third guest now, Caroline Gilfillan. Caroline has published four collections of poetry and her work has appeared in many anthologies and journals, including Poetry News, that's the Poetry Society News, and Mislexia. Her collection, yes, won the, uh, won the Best Poetry Book Award in the East Anglia Book Awards. She won the Yeovil Poetry Prize in 2019 and was a runner-up in the Edward Thomas Prize in 2021. She's currently developing Hail Sisters of the Revolution, a group of poems about the women's liberation movement of the 1970s. She's also a novelist and songwriter. So Caroline, can we hear from you now, please? Thank you very much, Janice. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Sujata, for inviting me to read. I'm going to read three poems, none of them, unfortunately, from Hail Sisters of the Revolution. <laughs> I should have wheeled them out, but... Um, Okay, so the first one is written about my experience of traveling to India in the last decade and volunteering um, in a school there, which was up in um, the Nilgiris, the mountains uh, of Tamil Nadu. And this was a school founded by a lady called Miss Daisy Victoria Armstrong, who was a very upper class um, woman who used to be a school inspector, went out and visited the Nilgiris and just loved it, and never went home again and founded this school. So I used to volunteer in a somewhat chaotic way with, with a guitar. So this is addressed to Miss Daisy Victoria Armstrong. You'd like the principal of the school. She's knowledgeable about bees and cashews, intimate with the laws of physics. You'd appreciate the turquoise of her sari and the pearl drops in her parasol earrings that tremble against her hair when she laughs. I'm told your words were weighted stones, but I think you'd like to know that in the classrooms of your former bungalow, the pupils are buoyant as bubbles, light as larks. You'd approve of the way they heard the skittish English language with their tongues. You'd praise the choir clustered under the tree, their voices loud enough to bring a house down. As assembly under sheets of morning sun, Socks embroidered with the school crest slip down around ankles. But rest assured, Miss Daisy Victoria Armstrong, that hands shoot up when questions are asked about you. You live on beneath ribboned plaques. Your stern breath whispers in my ear as I swish into classrooms carrying the greenery of Britain on my tongue. Some of you survives in the chalk dusting my fingers. That's the end of each day. All right, my next two poems, uh, the last two, obviously, 103, are about my, my grandmother and my foster grandmother. I'm writing a series about the grandparents I never knew. I never, never met any of them, they were all dead before I was born. So the first one is about my mother's mother, Emma Catherine Stevens, who was a woman with a great fondness of alcohol that got her into terrible trouble. Um, at the point this poem was written, she had four children, including my mother, and had taken, as you'll see, to going to pubs, which was very, very frowned upon at the time. So this is Emma Catherine Stevens, The Bell in Wandsworth, 1912. Ruby port purring at her lips, my grandmother buffs up her Irish fur, swaps tails with the crowd at the bar. She lifts her skirts to show off her boot buttons and do a swift twirl. For half an hour, she'll forget her husband's bald pate and blue stare. 
the string of his mouth arranged into a swiggle of disappointment. A fellow with mustard whiskers and wet lips is giving her the eye. With a blink, she reels him in like a speckled trout. Not that she'll do the whole house, your father. She's had enough of that to last till doomsday. But with a wink, she holds out her empty glass, opens up the smile her husband fell right into. Two hours later, when she's well and truly launched on a tide of port, she sways onto the cold paving stones. By Our Lady, where's the day gone? It's packed up and run over the hill, leaving a dirty dust behind. But the children are safe, aren't they? Asleep, the two boys huddle like puppies on a bench. The babies are tucked up in the pram. With tears pushing at tired eyes, Emma dips her head beneath the faded hood to breathe the earthy animal air. Curds and stale linen, mixed with her own ruby breath, sweat, aching breasts. So my final poem takes us on a little farther into the future. Um, Emma was either rejected from the home, sent to um, some kind of asylum or imprisoned because she disappeared and the children were put in various orphanages. And my mother went from the age of four to 14 to St. Saviour's Orphanage, which is not a happy experience. But after that, she was fostered with a wonderful woman called Caroline Robbins, who I'm named after. My full name is Caroline Robin Draper. Uh, and so this is in the voice of her foster mother, Caroline Robbins, 1922. She came to me rattling like a bundle of sticks. I swept her into the house with no fuss or questions and fed her up on bread and blackberry jam, so thick and treacly you'd think a whole summer's sun had squeezed itself into the jar. She ate, oh, how she ate. Her eyes darting left and right or over her shoulder in case someone else was waiting to pinch the lot. An orphanage will do that for you, especially one run by nuns with kindness watered down to a colourless drip and a metal hairbrush ready to smack. When she spoke, it was in a voice, quiet as leaves, back hunched so I could count the beads of her spine. I waited, knowing how green fruit ripens and loses its sour snap. I waited until she was ready, ready to show herself, be herself. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, Sue and Janice. Thank you, Caroline. That was that was lovely. Um, and we're going to hear a last little snippet from Sujata. Yes. Are you ready, Sujata? Thank you, Caroline, for sharing those beautiful poems. And um, you're an incredible coach. So Caroline um, helped me and um, gave me a really amazing foundation in poetry when she coached me some years ago and um yeah just a stunning poet and coach thank you so much oh thank you Sujata I, it was my pleasure <laughs> um so this final reading is just one poem um I'm I, I'm hugely honored to have been featured alongside nine other poets and sound artists that were commissioned to create new works inspired by Coventry City of Culture the show Windows Art Project uh, the project was inspired by a book written by L. Frank Bar Bohm, who wrote The Wizard of Oz. And um, for, for my piece, I wrote a poem that took six artist installations that were set up in empty shop windows and reimagined them as alternative city monuments that celebrated and promoted the richness of Coventry's urban environment. Each verse draws upon a show windows artwork and builds a monument from its imagery, structure and meaning. In doing so, it looks to open portals to the imagination where Coventry's histories, identities and sense of place are reflected in a carnival of words. The poem is written in free verse and linked by an all overarching theme of multiplicity. The idea that Coventry is not just a city, but in fact, many cities with many stories to tell. 
I have written from the perspective of a British Asian woman as she moves through the urban landscape of the ninth biggest city in England and the 11th biggest city of the UK. In writing from a, for a broad audience, I hope for my work to communicate on a variety of levels, for it to be accessible and relatable, yet ambiguous enough to spark the imagination and new ways for the reader to relate to their cityscape. The six artworks that inspired the poem, this next poem, are Coventry Phoenix Priding by Nathaniel Furman, Infinity Doors by Maimu, The Friendly Forest by Sharon Walters, Cocoon by Tammy Woodrow, who's here this evening, Creative Spark by Matt Chin, and Cobb as Oz by Ben Javins. So uh, the poem is called The Wizard of Cobb. I sleep walked through the city on an emerald brick road, feet scraping a rough cut of stories that do not glitter like gold. Six monuments sizzled in the dark, spitting flames on a trail that sneaked through shop windows and began to set sail. Over the glassy seas, the glassy seas where spells cannot be broken. One, Phoenix cast from the wires of a birdcage. Her tail rose from the ashes of old mothers, flew with a wingspan of a thousand chains, landed on multicolored ground that sucked on a plinth, raised high to alloy prey, and dropped eggs that birthed new cities, hatched, kissed, and cracked open to let the light in. Two, elephant, forged from the Maharaja's gold. An elephantine dream, swung wild to the wind, settles in the mud and the water of our homes, the mud and water from our food, the mud and water where the lotus looms above the towers and the turrets of a fortress that will not fold. Three, tree carved by the hands of slaves. A trunk is a trunk, whether stuck on an elephant's face or in the mud, dwells in forest piped from precious air, passed from mouth to mouth to breathe and be and balm, the paper cuts from jungle books and skin layered in urban scars. Nest soldered to a spike. I climbed into a nest fallen hard from a tree that had choked out a song from a bird that wouldn't sing, cocooned in a hex of twigs and cement, my breath fell asleep to a downtown lullaby. Five, spark, cut by a silver slash of sun. Soft quavers flew from my ears like sparks from a mind electric and wired to a magic music machine. Bright lights, big city shine down from my baby's head in a flash of two-toned fontanelle. Six, wizard, a holograph clings to a pedestal. Resurfaced by tarmacked fingers and toes, the trail returns us to where we began without a cat or a hat or a spell or a wand. Don't look for the wizard, don't look for the wizard. Just follow the double yellows down stony Stanton Road. When I awoke to the city, it was not greener on the other side, but the colours of the night had painted out my eyes, lined my skull with a new type of vision. I saw the phoenix pride, the elephant fly, trees became friends and nests became songs, sparks became birds, like black morning stars. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. It was the wizard's will twitching somewhere behind a curtain. Thank you, thank you Janice. Massive heartfelt thank you to everyone who has um, come this evening and taken the time out. I know everyone has families and are really busy. So um, yeah, huge thank you. Thank you Sajata. That your commissioned poem, how is it being presented by the um, commissioner? Yes, it's, it was shared um, online as part of an online digital project. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, very, very vivid. Hmm. Very rich. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody. What we usually do at the end of these launches, when everybody has been so good and sat there completely muted, is we say unmute 
clap. And everybody clap. Real time clap. Let's have some applause, please, for all the readers. For everybody. For all the readers and all the people who came and listened.